Jai Radha Madhava Punja Bihari Ananta Koti Vaishnava Ki. Thank you. Grantarad Srimad Bhagavatam Ki. Sam Veda Bhakta Rinda Ki. Gaur Premanandi. All glories to Samal devotees. All glories to Samal devotees. All glories to Sri Sri Guru and Sri Gauranga. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Oh Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Oh Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Om Namo 
Om Ajnanati Mirandasya Gananjana Shalakhaya Chakshur Unmilitam Yena Talmai Shri Guru Vena Maha Shri Chaitanya Mano Bishtam Shtapitam Yena Bhutale Swayam Rupa Kadamahyam Dadati Swapadantikam Vandeham Shri Guru Shri Yuta Pada Kamalam Shri Guru Vaishnavam Cha Shri Rupam Sagrajatam Sahagana Raghunatan Bitam Tam Sajivam Sadvaitam Sabadhunam Parijana Sahitam Krishna Chaitanya Devam Shri Radha Krishna Padan Sahagana Lalita Shri Vishakan Vitamscha He Krishna Karuna Sindho Dina Bando Jagatpate Gopesha Gopika Kanta Radha Kanta Namotstute Dapta Kanchana Gorangi Radhe Vrindavan Eshvari Vrishabhanu Sute Devi Pranamami Hari Priye Vanchakalpa Tarubhyascha Kripa Sindhu Bhya Evacha Patitanam Pabhanebhyo Vaishnavebhyo Namo Namaha Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Shri Advaita Gadadhara Shri Vasadi Gaur Bhakta Vrinda Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, and Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Okay, so we are on Canto 2, Chapter 9, Text 10. Answers by citing the Lord's version. Pravartate yatra rajas tamasteo. Pravartate yatra rajas tamasteo. Satvam cha mishram na cha kala vikrama. Satvam cha mishram na cha kala vikrama. Na yatra maya kimuta pare hare. Na yatra maya kimuta pare hare. Anu Vrata Yatra Sura Sura Chita Anu Vrata Yatra Sura Sura Chita Ravarta Te Yatra Rajas Tamastayo Satvam Chamishram Nachakala Vikrama Na yatra maya kimuta pare hare Anu vrata yatra sura sura chita Pravarta te yatra rajasta mastayo Pravarta te yatra rajasta mastayo 
Satvam cha mishram na cha kala vikramaha Nayatra maya kimuta pare hare Anubrata yatra sura sura architaha Pravarta te yatra rajasthamasthayo Satvam cha mishram na cha kala vikramaha <coughs> Nayatra maya kimuta pare hare Anubrata yatra sura sura chitaha Pravartate prevail Yatra wherein Rajatamaha the modes of passion and ignorance Tayoho, of both of them. Satvam, the mode of goodness. Cha, and. Mishram, mixture. Na, never. Cha, and. Kala, time. Vikramaha, influence. Na, neither. Yatra, therein. Maya, illusory external energy. Kim, what? Uta, there is. Apare, others. Harehe, of the personality of Godhead. Anuvrataha, devotees. Yatra, Wherein? Sura, by the demigods. Asura, and the demons. Architaha, worshipped. So the translation reads, in that personal abode of the Lord, the material modes of ignorance and passion do not prevail, nor is there any of their influence in goodness. There is no predominance of the influence of time. So what to speak of the illusory external energy? It cannot enter that region. Without discrimination, both the demigods and demons worship the Lord as devotees. So I say, and you please repeat, in that personal abode of the Lord, the material modes of ignorance and passion do not prevail, nor is there any influence in goodness. There is no predominance of the influence of time. So what to speak of the illusory external energy? It cannot enter that region. Without discrimination, both demigods and demons Worship the Lord as devotees. So here's the purport by Srila Prabhupada. The kingdom of God or the atmosphere of the Vaikuntha nature, which is called the Tripad Vibhuti, is three times bigger than the material universes and is described here as also in the Bhagavad Gita. In a nutshell, <coughs> This universe containing billions of stars and planets is one of the billions of such universes clustered together within the compass of the Mahatattva. And all these millions and billions of universes combined together constitute only one fourth of the magnitude of the whole creation of the Lord. There is the spiritual sky also. Beyond the sky are the spiritual planets under the names of Vaikuntas, and all of them constitute three-fourths of the entire creation of the Lord. God's creations are always innumerable. Even when the leaves of the tree cannot be counted 
by a man, nor the hairs on his head. However, foolish men are puffed up with the idea of becoming God himself, though unable to create a hair of their own bodies. Men may discover so many wonderful vehicles of journey, but even if he reaches the moon by his much advertised spacecraft, he cannot remain there. The same man, therefore, without being puffed up as if he were the god of the universe, abides by the instructions of Vedic literature, the easiest way to acquire knowledge in transcendence. So let us know through the authority of Srimad Bhagavatam of the nature and constitution of the transcendental world beyond the material sky. In that sky, the material qualities, especially the modes of ignorance and passion, are completely absent. The mode of ignorance influences a living entity to the habit of lust and hankering. And this means that in the Vaikuntha Lokas, the living entities are free from these two things. As confirmed in Bhagavad Gita, it is the Brahma Bhuta stage of life. One becomes free from hankering and lamentation. Therefore, the conclusion is that the inhabitants of the Vaikuntha planets are all Brahma Bhuta living entities, as distinguished from the mundane creatures who are all compact in hankering and lamentation. When one is not in the modes of ignorance and passion, one is supposed to be situated in the mode of goodness in the material world. Goodness in the material world also at times becomes contaminated by touches of the modes of passion and ignorance. In the Vaikuntha Loka, it is unalloyed goodness only. The whole situation there is one of freedom from the illusory manifestation of the external energy. Although the illusory energy is also part and parcel of the Supreme Lord, illusory energy is differentiated from the Lord. The illusory energy is not, however, false, as claimed by the monist philosophers. The rope accepted as a snake may be an allusion to a particular person, but the rope is a fact, and the snake is also a fact. The illusion of water on the hot desert may be illusion for the ignorant animal searching for water in the desert, but the desert and the water are actual facts. Therefore, the material creation of the Lord may be an illusion to the non-devotee, but to a devotee, even the material creation of the Lord is a fact, as the manifestation of his external energy. But this energy of the Lord is not all. The Lord has his internal energy also, which has another creation known as the Vaikuntha Lokas, where there is no ignorance, no passion, no illusion, no past, no present. With a poor fund of knowledge, one may be able to be unable to understand the existence of such things as the Vaikuntha atmosphere, but that does not nullify its existence. That spacecraft cannot reach these planets. That spacecraft cannot reach these planets does not mean that there are no such planets, for they are described in the revealed scriptures. As quoted by Srila Jiva Goswami, we can know from the Narada Pancharatra that the transcendental world or the Vaikuntha atmosphere is enriched with transcendental qualities. These transcendental qualities, as revealed through devotional service of the Lord, are distinct from the mundane qualities of ignorance, passion, and goodness. Such qualities are not attainable by the non-devotee class of men. In the Padma Puran, Uttarakhanda, it is stated that beyond the one-fourth part of God's creation is the three-fourths manifestation. And the spiritual manifestation 
the marginal line between the material manifestation and the spiritual manifestation is the Viraja river and beyond the Viraja, which is also a transcendental current flowing from the perspiration of the body of the Lord, there is the three-fourths manifestation of God's creation. This part is eternal, everlasting, without deterioration and unlimited. And it contains the highest perfectional stage of living conditions. In the Sankhya Kamoni, it is stated that unalloyed goodness or transcendence is just opposite to the material modes. All living entities, there are eternally associated without any break, and the Lord is the chief and prime entity. In the Agama Puran also, the transcendental abode is described as follows. The associated members there are free to go everywhere within the creation of the Lord, and there is no limit to such creation, particularly in the region of the three-fourths magnitude. Since the nature of that region is unlimited, there is no history of such association, nor is there end to it. The conclusion may be drawn that because the complete, of the complete absence of the mundane qualities of ignorance and passion, there is no question of creation nor of annihilation. In the material world, everything is created and everything is annihilated. And the duration of life between creation and annihilation is temporary. In the transcendental realm, there is no creation, no destruction, and thus the duration of life is eternal unlimitedly. In other words, everything in the transcendental world is everlasting, full of knowledge and bliss without deterioration. Since there is no deterioration, there is no past, present, and future in the estimation of time. It is clearly stated in this verse that the influence of time is conspicuous by its absence. The whole material existence is manifest by actions and reactions of elements which make the influence of time prominent in the matter of past, present, and future. There are no such actions and reactions of cause and effect there. So the cycles of birth, growth, existence, transformation, deterioration, annihilation, these six material changes are not existent there. It is the unalloyed manifestation of the energy of the Lord without illusion, as experienced here in the material world. The whole Vaikuntha existence proclaims that everyone there is a follower of the Lord. The Lord is the chief leader there without any competition for leadership. And the people in general are all followers of the Lord. It is confirmed in the Vedas, therefore, that the Lord is the chief leader and all other entities, living entities, are subordinate to him. For only the Lord satisfies all the needs of all other living entities. Pravartate yatra rajasthamastayo Satvam cha mishram natrakala vikramaha na yatra maya kimuta parehare anuvrata yatra sura sura chitaha. In that personal abode of the Lord, the material modes of ignorance and passion do not prevail, nor is there any of their influence in goodness. There is no predominance of the influence of time. So what to speak of the illusory external energy? It cannot enter that region. Without discrimination, both demigods and demons worship the Lord as devotees. Wow, what a purport. Well, there's a lot to cover there. This section here is uh, a section that uh, describes <coughs> the answers that Parikit is receiving from uh, Sukadeva Goswami. And back in the last chapter, in chapter eight of Second Canto, 
uh, these questions were enumerated. So we heard about uh, the first question Prickett had was about the nature of how does the living entity get tangled up with this body? What's the relationship between the body and the living entity? So that question has already been answered in the first three slokas of this chapter, chapter nine. Then the question arose by Pariket of, does the Supreme Lord have a body just like other living entities have a body? And that question was also dispatched uh, earlier. And now the third in the succession of queries by uh, Pariket was about how the Supreme Lord met Brahma and uh, showed him the Vaikuntha worlds, and that's where we are today in 2.9.10. So this is what we're hearing about, this uh, wonderful moment where Brahma, we heard about it in the last few verses, he was supposed to create the universe, but he didn't know how. And he was bewildered. He couldn't even figure out where he had come from himself. But he was situated on a lotus flower, so he descended within the stem of the lotus flower. And he was unable to learn anything or make any progress. So he came back up. And he heard the two syllables, ta, pa, the 16th and 21st of the Sparsha alphabet. <laughs> so uh, he heard these two syllables, and they, of course, mean to engage in austerity. He surmised, although he could not see anyone, that this must be the Supreme Lord speaking to him. So for a thousand years of the demigods, he performed austerities. And then the Lord was pleased with him, which is where we're getting to in our present uh, point in Srimad Bhagavatam. So the Lord was pleased with him. And the Lord revealed to Brahma the Vaikuntha worlds. So what we're learning here and this is a very important part of the philosophy of Krishna consciousness, is how the spiritual world and the material world are similar and at the same time they're also different. So in some ways they're similar, in other ways they're different. One of the things that's patently obvious about the world that we live in is the fact that things seem not quite right here, that uh, somewhere in the back of our minds, we always have this idea that, uh, of perfection. And we try to uh, look at the world that we actually inhabit, this material world, we look at it, and we see that it is imperfect in so many ways. So if we recognize the world is imperfect, where do we get the idea of perfection? We are, you know, living here in the material world, and we sense that the external world is imperfect. Of course, from one angle of vision, it is perfect because it was designed by the Supreme Lord. But from another angle of vision, from a conditioned angle of vision, we see that so many things are imperfect, that people are born, and sometimes people are not born with fully functional bodies. People die, <coughs> there are wars, there is disease, there are disasters. People hanker for things that they cannot achieve. People get things, and those things cause their own downfall. 
People make organizations, those organizations fail to some extent. People build machines, those machines gradually fall apart. Um, people make grand plans, people devise philosophies. These philosophies don't exactly hold water. So everywhere we look in the world that we're surrounded by, we see imperfections. And uh, we can recognize that if we sense imperfection, there must be somewhere where things are actually perfect. If this is a virtual world or this is a class B world, somewhere there must be a class A world. There must be a perfect world. And that is the Vaikuntha world. And we come from the perfect world, but uh, because we all tested positive for uh, uh, God enviitis, we wound up here in the quarantine zone of the <laughs> material world. So we all wound up here. And here, we see these contrasts that are being described by Prabhupada in the purport. We see these opposites that uh, in the spiritual world, there is no rajas, tamas, and sattva. There is just shuddha sattva. In the material world, there is rajas, tamas, and sattva, but it is uh, diluted sattva. In the spiritual world, everything is sat, chit, and ananda. In the material world, everything is asat, achit, and nirananda. So things in the spiritual world are eternal, knowledgeable, and blissful. In the material world, they're temporary, uh, ignorant, and miserable. So this is the contrast. And Prabhupada explains some more of these various features of the spiritual world that sound very strange to us in some ways, that there is no existence of time. There is no existence of destructive time in the spiritual world. Here in the material world, time separates us from things. Time separates us from situations we like, time situate, separates us from people that we want to be with, time separates us from the plans and fruit of what we work for. So we are separated in the past and we are separated in the future. And in the material world, we are always thinking about the past and the future because rarely are we satisfied with the present. So because the present is not what we wish it was, we think about the good times that happened in the past, you know, those were the days, <laughs> you know. So people think about the, uh, past and some wonderful things that they remember, you know. And also, just as much, when we are not satisfied by the present, we think about the future, ah, uh, then it will be very wonderful, just you wait and see that in the future things will be wonderful. So we imagine a world where we'll be darting throughout the various galaxies in our faster than light, uh, you know, spaceships, visiting new planets and uh, uh, seeing new forms of life. And uh, we will be like gods and goddesses floating throughout the universe doing whatever we want. Of course, this is the way that Hollywood uh, tries to uh, spruce it all up. I remember one time when I was, I, I 
not sure how old I was exactly, you know, maybe 15 or 16. And I was thinking, the year 2000, wow. <laughs> 2000. By a, for sure, you know, uh, you know, I'll be 48 years old when that year comes around. Wow. What will we be like to be 48 years <laughs> old? And by, for sure, we'll be traveling to the moon, you know, and there'll be flying cars and uh, all this kind of thing. I thought, wow. We'll probably not even have to eat. We'll just take pills. <laughs> Of course, uh, no flying cars yet. I'm still waiting for flying cars. Uh, but I don't think they're anywhere soon because uh, the more you think about flying cars, the more you think about the fact that they're a bad idea in general because, uh, you know, most of uh, the human population are dunderheads, you know. And in aviation, there's no room for dunderheads, you know. When you do something a little wrong in aviation, it's all over. There's no second chance, you know. If you run out of gas in a car, you pull over and uh, you call up, um, you know, AAA or something like that, and they bring something out to you, you know. In an airplane, you run out of gas. It's all over, mostly. <laughs> No, it, you don't get to call AAA. You just crash into the ground and people remember what you were like, you know, when you were still alive and they make some nice eulogy or whatever it is, you know. So uh, no flying cars. Um, and still not going to the moon on a regular basis, you know. Nobody's got any chartered flights there yet, you know. So uh, that's not happening either. But we did get computers, which I had never guessed would be a big thing. You know, so uh, now we have, and our, who could forget, cell phones. So we <laughs> have you know, those things which are maybe better than flying cars or going to the moon. So uh, at any rate, when we're not happy with the present, which is most of the time, then we escape into the past or the future. So in the spiritual world, the present is so lush and full of things that we don't have to think about the past or the future. Everything is uh, eternally existing. Nobody is born, nobody dies in the spiritual world. Everybody serves the Lord. And everybody wants to serve the Lord. It's interesting here <laughs> that it says even the demons serve the Lord in the spiritual world. So actually they're not demons, you know. Uh, they're, you know, uh, it's just a label only, you know, that uh, the devotees are the only class of people in the spiritual world. Otherwise they wouldn't be there. They would be where we are, you know, all of us um, positive testers for God envy we're all here, so we have to be quarantined and wear our masks here. But in the spiritual world, you can stay there. And as Prabhupada mentions, uh, the scriptures tell us about the Tripad Vibhuti, which is the three quarters of the spiritual world, which is the larger portion of creation, which is populated with all these Vaikuntha people. Vaikuntha means, of course, without kunta. Kunta is misery or suffering or difficulty. So Vaikuntha means a place where there's no such stuff. So here, of course, it's not hard to find kunta. It's everywhere, around every corner, hanging off every street lamp. It's everywhere, everywhere we go. There are various kinds of difficulties, awkward situations, miseries, um, unfortunate circumstances, um, difficult events, etc., etc. <clears throat> so we're seeing this contrast between this Vaikuntha world that's being revealed to Brahma. So because Brahma 
performed austerities, and these austerities were not mundane austerities done for some material benefit, but they were actually devotional service. For that reason, the Supreme Lord actually gave Brahma a look at the Vaikuntha world. So he was actually being able to see it. And when Brahma was um, met by the Supreme Lord, the Supreme Lord was satisfied with him. And in a few verses, we'll learn that because the Supreme Lord was satisfied with Brahma, then the Supreme Lord was uh, going to give him the necessary knowledge. It was revealed in his heart of how to create the universes. So he wouldn't have any difficulty in performing the task that was given to him as the first being in the universe. So this material world is like a two-dimensional television image of the spiritual world. Everything is here that's in the spiritual world, but it's like a two-dimensional two version of it. So uh, this is the virtual reality. This is the chopped down version. This is, as I sometimes call it, the Kmart version of the spiritual world. It's the, um, everything is not so much here. Everything is um, not very well um, set up for our material enjoyment. Of course, there is some material enjoyment, but it's mixed in with so much other stuff that it hardly does anything for us for the most part. So, in this material world, the Supreme Lord stays conspicuously out of sight. Even though he's everywhere, he's the sum and substance, the warp and woof of the material world, we don't see him anywhere. He appears to be completely absent and therefore Atheists stand on their soapboxes and say, where is this God, you say, you talk about him. Well, where is he? And the answer is, he's everywhere, as Prahlad said uh, in response to his father, you know, Hiranyakashipu, he's everywhere. But Hiranyakashipu didn't have the eyes to see him, nor do the atheists. Because premanjana churito bhaktivilo chanena, one's eyes have to be tinged with the salve of love of God to see him. If we are skeptical of God, if we are antagonistic towards God, then he reserves the right not to be visible. Therefore, those who don't want God, don't believe in God, who dislike God, they don't see him. And he's only reciprocating with them. That's all there is to it. They don't want him, so. He stays out of the way. And in the material world, most people do not want God. So he's kind of out of the way for the most part. He doesn't appear here. In the spiritual, it's impossible to miss God. God's at the center of everything. That's what everybody's doing and thinking. And of course, we are told we need to become devotees. We need to become servants. But this doesn't sound so attractive to most people. Being a servant in the material world is not <coughs> something people are driving after in huge numbers. Being a servant seems like something that's second class or maybe even fifth class. Being a servant seems like something that's unwanted, un, uh, not very happy because we think we will be bored. I noticed that in this purport, at least on my cell phone here, there is a, there was a quote where Prabhupada talks about um, the Brahma Bhuta platform where one surpasses both uh, hankering and lamenting. Now, in the Vedavase upstairs, there's a verse there 
that's uh, Srimad Bhagavatam 4.30.20, where that comes from, but it isn't listed on my cell phone here. Um, so at any rate, uh, this verse is an interesting verse, 4.30.20 in uh, Srimad Bhagavatam, where the Brahma Bhuta platform is described as the place where there is no hankering or lamentation. And in the purport, Prabhupada talks about the fact that it's not like people are bored or hackneyed or they're doing some trivial, insignificant, unsatisfying thing. Why we dislike or are suspicious of the concept of becoming a servant, why we feel like that is because in the material world, certainly these are the qualifications that come with being a servant. One is bored, one is doing something that's trivial, one is um, deferring to someone else, one is trying to um, to withhold one's own desires in deference to someone else's desires. All these things seem unattractive, and in the material world certainly they are, but this is not what the spiritual world is. To get connected with the Supreme Lord is a mysterious, constantly evolving, uh, and unfathomable kind of thing. You know, it, you're never sure what's going to happen next, and with the Supreme Lord, there's always some new surprise. It's never the same old, same old. Even if you do repeat some activities or some circumstances or events do, to some extent, um, reiterate themselves, they're never exactly quite the same. So at any rate, the spiritual world is a place where there's no hankering or no, no lamentation, where there's only pure goodness, shuddha shattva. So passion and ignorance do not exist in the Vaikuntha world. And it says here that goodness is not adulterated or tinged with a small aspect of passion and ignorance. Even in the material world, even goodness is not pure. It is mixed. And so that's why we say we have to rise above the three modes. So why are we rising above goodness? That goodness is not pure goodness. We are rising above adulterated goodness to pure goodness. And if we're in pure goodness, then that's non-different from being in the spiritual world. So. These are some of the points that are mentioned in this purport. There are far too many points to discuss them all, but at uh, any rate, I'll stop here, and if there are any questions or comments, we can uh, discuss a little bit further. Yeah. Hankering in the future, lamenting about the past, or vice versa. Or vice versa. And just, just learning to be satisfied with the present. Krishna mentions that that's one of the austerities of the mind, the satisfaction. Yeah. So why is it that, you know, it's like it seems that we're never satisfied in our present situation? And then our mind might trick us to think, well, maybe if I do this, or maybe if I go here, or, you know, when I, I can't be satisfied where I am. Yeah, that's uh, described in the Chaitanya Charitamrita, you know, what is it? Uh, uh, Krishna bhakta nishkama atta eva santa bhukti, bhukti mukti siddhi kame sakale asanta, you know. So um, asanta means restless, you know. So santa means uh, settled or um, you know, non-restless, you know, peaceful. So it's the material desires in our hearts that cause us 
to be constantly evaluating, constantly rethinking, and constantly, you know, uh, uh, juggling options, you know. Um, when we finally become fully sold out to Krishna and we become fully engaged in Krishna consciousness, then we're kind of in the now, in the moment, in the uh, flow of what's going on because we're tuned in to the Supreme Lord and we don't have so much of this hankering and lamenting, you know, which is the hallmark of material consciousness. But <coughs> this takes some time to manifest, you know, it doesn't happen overnight. Uh, the waters of one's consciousness don't uh, settle out right away. It takes some time for, you know, the waters to become more still, to become like a lamp in a windless place, as is described in Bhagavad Gita. So consciousness, as the modes of passion and ignorance leave, then there's only one thing left, and that's Sudhasattva. And Sudhasattva is ultimate peacefulness. You know, so there may be dynamic activity taking place, but that dynamic activity is not full of hankering and lamenting or of material juggling that's missing. You know, so um, as long as someone wants mukti mukti siddhi or kami, so if one is a you know material wants material desires either. Uh, liberation, material desire, or some kind of uh, mystic uh, cities, as long as one is still got an eye out for those, then one will not be peaceful, one will not be able to be in the moment, to be actually thinking in terms of um, what it is to serve Krishna, and uh, be lost in one's engagement in Krishna's service. Rather, one will think, well, maybe I would have it better here, better there. And this comes from our experience in the material world. We are always, as I say, you know, juggling options. So, so this is, you know, um, Krishna Bhakta Nishkama, Atta Eva Shanta, Bhukti Mukti Siddhi Kame Sakale Asanta. Uh, and this is because, you know, we still have uh, these tinges of uh, the modes of nature and because we still have material desires. But as they gradually get uh, thrown out by the process of devotional service, um, one becomes steady. And that's what we hear, you know, there's uh, the the uh, nine stages of devotional service, you know, Adho Shraddha, Tadho Sadhu Sangha, uh, uh, Bhajana Kriya, Tanishta, Ruchis, Tatas, Shaktis, you know, so we have, um, we have <coughs> Shraddha, which is uh, faith, Sadhu Sangha, which is association with devotees, then there's Bhajana Kriya, which is engaging in devotional activities of uh, nine processes under the agency of a bona fide spiritual master. Then there is um, uh, nishta, which is uh, steadiness, you know. Then there's, you know, uh, or actually, is it adho shraddha tata sadhu sangata bhajana kriya tata nishta ruchis tataha Atta shakta sata bhavas tata prema budanchati sadha kana mayam premna pardur bhave bhavet kramaha. So, yes, after, um, you know, bhajana kriya comes nishta, which is steadiness, you know. And then there's uh, ruchi after that taste. So, when a person becomes steady in devotional service, that means that one's consciousness has kind of risen above the, you know, uh, hankering and lamenting, you know, uh, of the material uh, pattern of life. 
And once one becomes steady, then ruchi comes, which is taste, when we can actually feel satisfied completely in our devotional service without thinking, well, maybe if I mix in some material, this or that, uh, I'll be okay. So it's a gradual process, a gradual purification. It uh, works like that. Any other comments or questions? All right, great. All glories to Srimad Bhagavatam. All glories to the Vaishnav devotees of the Lord. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna.